Han en hår i vårt våg i vårt Windsor på. Amen. Today in the Armenian Church, we celebrate one of the five tabernacle feasts of our church. And this day is not simply a feast that we as Armenians celebrate, but Orthodox Christians throughout the world, everyone on September 14th, celebrates this feast day. Well, today is September 11th, so that may seem strange to us, but the way that our church calendar works is that for these major feast days, we always move them to the Sunday closest. So for us, we always celebrate this feast on September 11th, and the rest of the world will celebrate this feast in just a couple of days. This feast is a very interesting feast day for us because it's one in a series of events that happens this week. Yesterday, we commemorated a feast called the Dedication of the Church of the Holy Cross. And really, in some ways, this is the heart of this celebration of the cross that we have for the next week. This was the commemoration of the dedication of the Church of the Holy Cross in Jerusalem over the very spot where Jesus had been crucified. And so as part of this celebration, on day two of the celebration of the consecration of this feast, a relic of the true cross was brought out from the bishop and was exalted high in the air so that everyone could worship it. And so ultimately there's something very powerful, of course, about the true cross being brought out and that relic being um, worshipped by all. And so that ended up taking prominence in our church calendar. And this feast day that we celebrate today begins a series of feasts that we're going to see throughout the fall, all concerning the cross. We are entering the season of the cross. And so I think every year when we get to this point in our church calendar, it's worth taking a moment to pause and to take a step back and to reflect on the cross a little bit and to ask a very simple question and maybe remind ourselves of something that we may be desensitized to. Our relationship as a church with the cross on its surface seems very strange. We are so used to it as Armenian Christians. They adorn our churches. They're made of gold. We find them all over the place. We make the sign of the cross. We're so used to it. However, um, in one of his most provocative um, lessons that I've ever received from him, Bishop Daniel brought to us as seminarians the fact that the cross that we exalt today would be the modern equivalent, or the, I'm sorry, the ancient equivalent of our modern AK-47. It's an execution device. That is what we have come today in order to lift up and to adorn in the beautiful basil that was donated by many of our parishioners. An execution device. That's the thing that we have gathered today to celebrate. We must remind ourselves of that for us to truly understand and to enter into the depths of what the cross means to us. And so for us to understand why we as Christians would gather together to exalt an execution device, I'd like us to take some time this morning looking at the various readings that we associated with this feast day. You might assume that on a feast of the cross, at least one of the readings would have to do with the story of the crucifixion of Jesus. And yet that's not what we find in today's set of readings. What do we find? Well, our first reading comes from Isaiah chapter 49, and it opens with the following words. Sing for joy, O you heavens, and exult, O earth, Break forth, O mountains, into singing, for the Lord has comforted his people and will have compassion on his afflicted. So already here, we're starting with maybe a different tone than we might expect when speaking about an execution device. We hear words like joy, exultation, singing, comfort, and compassion. Something strange for us to reflect on. What about the next reading from St. Paul's letter to the Galatians? But far be it from me to glory except for in the cross of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, by which the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. 
For neither circumcision counts for anything nor uncircumcision, but a new creation. Peace and mercy be upon all who walk by this rule, upon the Israel of God. In this reading again, we seem to be following in a similar theme. Whereas it was about joy and singing in the first reading, now we're talking about glorification. That somehow through this execution device, this is what we glorify. This is what we put our glory toward. And out of this somehow, St. Paul says, comes a new creation. That somehow peace comes out of this violence weapon, this weapon that caused the violence, ultimately the death of God, right? Peace, somehow, and mercy. Maybe a little bit strange. Maybe if you had not been um, um, born and bred in the Armenian church or in the Christian tradition, you would find these readings strange when associated with today's feast. And finally, we have the Gospel reading. Again, like I said before, you might expect us to have an account of the crucifixion, which is the time in the Bible when we hear about the cross, but that's not what we hear today. What do we hear, though? We hear from the Gospel of John the following words. No one has ascended into heaven, but he who descended from heaven, the Son of Man. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that everyone who believes in him may have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. Once again, this is a lovely reading until you realize that it's in context of an execution device. That somehow out of this instrument of death, not only is mercy and peace coming from it, but eternal life. That just as Jesus came down from heaven, through this execution device, we all one day will be lifted into God's kingdom. And that this is the ultimate act of love that God can have for us. So I think we need to ask the question this morning and reflect upon how the suffering of Christ upon this cross can somehow lead to the following. Joy, exaltation, singing, comfort, compassion, glory, a new creation, peace, mercy, love, and eternal life. That's a question that we are called to reflect upon as Christians. We would not tend to think of an execution device as something that leads to these things. The suffering that this device is not only caused to Jesus Christ, but of course to many throughout history. How can this now become a symbol of all of those things? And I would say that this leads to another question. How might we need to change our perspective on suffering to understand the meaning of this cross right here? I think that most of us have the perspective, and it's the perspective that's all around us, that all suffering is bad. That our ultimate goal in life is to decrease suffering and to enhance or to promote comfort. That is not the perspective that we hear from the gospel. That's not the perspective that Christianity offers us. Christianity is very realistic. The Christian message very clearly shows us that suffering is just a part of this life. Suffering is a part of this world that we live in today. The suffering is not the part that matters. There's something else that we need to consider, maybe a formula we could call it, for how to make sense of our suffering. And the formula is the following. Suffering plus purpose equals transformation. I'll say that again. Suffering plus purpose equals transformation. Many of us go through life and we suffer many things, and the times that this suffering is the worst, is the hardest to bear, is when this suffering is accompanied with no purpose. 
when it's meaningless, when it's senseless. However, I think that we can all think of moments in our life where we have indeed endured some sort of suffering and the experience has been transformational for us because of the purpose that envelops that suffering. Some simple examples from, from just our everyday lives. A mother who is in labor, right? She indeed is enduring quite a lot of suffering, agonizing pain, the type of pain that God willing, she'll never need to experience at any other point in her life. And yet with this suffering, because of the purpose of this suffering, comes a transformation of this woman now becoming a mother, becoming the one who has granted life to a new human being. An incredible gift, an incredible transformation, which makes the suffering worth it. We can think of a more mundane example of an athlete who's in training. Any athlete who a operates on a high level is going to experience quite a lot of suffering, quite a lot of pain. However, that suffering, when put toward a purpose, yields an incredible reward of becoming a champion in whatever sport they're competing in. Maybe we think about um, some of the stresses of modern life as another example of People who, because of the economic situation, need to work multiple jobs, right? Maybe shift workers who work crazy hours, um, the middle of the night, right? Many of us know people or ourselves are people who do this sort of work. That sort of work, without purpose, is, is misery. However, those who do it to support their family and keep that purpose in mind, when you talk to most of them, will say, that all of the suffering that that sort of work takes is worth it for the purpose that I'm working toward. And finally, one last example. We have many, um, in, uh, many of our family members or we know people personally or maybe we ourselves were at some point involved with the military. Veterans certainly undergo, no matter what sort of work they did in the military, each and every veteran has gone through some sort of suffering in their process. However, if you talk to them, the majority of them, if the cause that they were fighting for at their point of service was something they believed in, they will say time and time again that it was worth it. However, maybe you talk to a veteran who did not understand the meaning of the war that he was fighting. Well, that suffering then becomes more of a wound and it's not transformational. It's not something that's life-giving to that individual. Suffering plus purpose equals transformation. And I would like to say, on the other side of that equation is another equation, that comfort without purpose leads to misery. Some of the most comfortable people that we know in our lives, and I think you all know these people, who on the surface looks like they have everything in the world, and yet they're miserable. How could this be? This could only be if suffering is not the ultimate evil and comfort is not the ultimate good. There has to be another piece in the equation. And that piece is living a purpose-driven life, of living your life with meaning. And that's what we see with the cross. Christ has given us the ultimate example of suffering for a purpose, suffering for the most important purpose, which, of course, is saving us, his creatures, giving us new life, that through his suffering, through his fully empathizing with our brokenness, he was able to transform that brokenness into something precious, into new life with him. I think that a lot of times we miss the message of the cross, and we miss the message that it's calling us to remember that there will be suffering in this life, but that when we put that suffering in God's hands, when we allow his gospel to redefine that suffering, to give purpose to that suffering, then it can indeed be a transformational experience. This is easier said than done, but this is the message that the cross is going to call us to reflect upon for the next several weeks. I pray that each of us might be able to seek purpose in our suffering, 
and to come first and foremost to this altar, to our loving God, to find that purpose. There will be moments in our life when the suffering seems completely meaningless, completely purposeless. And those are the very moments when we need to double down in our prayer life, when we need to double down in coming together with other Christians who have this same perspective on the world to help us see how in some way God may be working through the tragedy, through the sorrow, through the suffering, to bring us to the place that he needs us to be. I pray that each of us may be able to come into this mystery of the holy and precious cross and may be able to offer the one who suffered on this cross with purpose to transform us all and offer him praise and glory with the Father and with the Holy Spirit, now and always and unto the ages of ages. Amen.